the biggest surprise was the amount of um, after-tax earnings that the average person spends on energy. In this area, uh, and I'm going to jump to one of the conclusions of the report, um, over $30 million leaves this community every year. And that works out to be about 25, 24 to 25% of the after-tax income. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. As a community looks at using less energy and less resources, where does it begin? My guest today is Brian Corzelius from Willits, uh, California, who's been part of the Willits um, Economic Localization Group, WELL. And I'd say it looks like you're sort of the energy maven of the group here, or at least, what, a renewable energy uh, fanatic, as you fanatic, said? Fanatic, that's a good point. Yeah, but uh, it looks to me like a, a quiet and studious fanatic. Your group embarked on inventorying your community resources very early on. That's correct. What's that like? What did you learn from it? Um, we learned an awful lot. It was, it was quite surprising. Um, the biggest surprise was the amount of um, after-tax earnings that the average person spends on energy. In this area, uh, and I'm going to jump to one of the conclusions of the report, um, over $30 million leaves this community every year. And that works out to be about 25, 24 to 25% of the after-tax income per really? person. So a quarter to, to going out to what? Going out to, to sources outside of this area, uh, albeit um, we did include firewood in there, but with very negligible value. Mm -hmm. the, the other interesting facet that came out is over half of that, roughly about 55%, is gasoline and other transportation fuels. So of that 25% of after-tax earnings, people are spending a, about a quarter of that on... 13 to 14%. On gasoline. Or, the rest is going to what, electricity? Electricity to heat and, their homes. And, and natural gas or propane to heat their homes That's as well. That's correct, yes. That's a lot of money. It's an That's awful a lot, lot of, of money. money. And we have to remember this community is, for our definition, is the 95490 zip code, which is about 320 square miles and includes about 13,000 people. Okay. So uh, when we look at that, that's the area we looked at and the size of the survey of uh, what it encompassed. What else did your survey cover? You inventoried energy, mm -hmm. so we dropped the energy cost is big. What else did you look at and, and why? Well. Let's back up. Uh, our focus, um, when WELL cr was created, one of the things we did was we looked at what were our interests. And so we created um, some of roughly six groups. And I'll try to remember them all, but energy was one of them. Food um, was another. Shelter was another. Uh, water, um, medicine, health and medicine. Um, Transportation. Transportation. Transportation to, initially was part of energy. Aha! Uh -huh. And that was an interesting split off that only happened within the last six months. But we needed to focus on energy first and then start working on transportation solutions. Um, one of the eye openers, and, and I'm only speaking from the energy group point, when we did the inventory, um, was how difficult it was to get this kind of information. For example, uh, electricity usage, electricity and natural gas. If you call PG&E, they will not talk to you. You need to get your common council or some city official to make that call to be able to get the information. 
Otherwise, what will happen is the PUC will refer you to countywide statistics, which don't quite fit into your zip code. If you're if you're doing a regional, a different region than your whole county, you can look at a, at a countywide. Um, in fact, I did use the countywide statistics as a way of checking the end result because that would, it would give me a boundary, an upper boundary. It would give me some figures for each of the different categories. Um, the, the big problems there, though, are there are some companies that are within the uh, quasi-public domain that, that will not give out that kind of information. And um, the other difficult area was transportation. The transportation fuels. How do you figure I'm sorry, that? How do you figure how much gasoline is getting pumped, you know, or diesel, or, and that's just. I mean, how do you? Were you trying to? So there's that, and how do you even account for trucks that come in bringing supplies? And, See, this, it's daunting this, to this me. is where you get into an interesting aspect because we live on Highway 101, so you've got tourist traffic passing through that's filling up their tank. Yes. How do you discern between that and the local population? Well, one of the advantages we had was Caltrans performed statistics on the people passing through here. They can give you statistics on the number of vehicles per day and can help you figure out, if not outright give you statistics, on how much of that is local traffic. How do they know? Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> they just, okay, it may not matter. Part of that is, um, I think, the way that they sense the traffic moving, and this is the engineer talking here, but um, they have traffic detectors oh. that they can route on any side street, any off street, and so forth. So when they do a census of the traffic moving through an area, they're also looking at the traffic that's being diverted off through there. Okay. So through Caltrans, we were able to figure out what's the total volume of traffic going through here and how much of it is local traffic. Through talking to the local gas stations, we were able to get the total amount of fuel being sold. Okay. Through going to the Department of Transportation, we were able to figure out statistics, as well as the U.S. Census, how many cars were, are owned here what is the mix of cars, again, from the Department of Transportation? What is their average gas mileage? I'm going to haul us back up to a higher level here sure. in the inventory. Just for a minute, because oh, as yeah. an engineer... But, but see, this is how you have to figure out. That's a lot of sleuthing. Yes. Right? Did that kind of sleuthing have happen in the other inventory areas for food, for shelter? I mean... How do people try and inventory those other resources? Well, let me interject at this point, big <laughs> caution. If you're going to start a group like this, make sure the inventory gets done when everybody is fresh and ready to go. Yeah! <laughs> because what happens is you get um, people who come in who are ready to get out there and do a project. They want to put solar on a roof, they want to put in gardens and so forth, mm -hmm. but they aren't willing to take the time, especially as time goes on in the group's formation and existence, um, to step back and say, well, what really has happened here before? What other groups, what have they tried? Who are those other groups? Um, what are the facilities, the resources we have to work with? If we're looking at truly localizing, we need to understand that. And we were very fortunate because we needed to figure out what are the fuels available here? I'm speaking from an energy group again. What are the fuels we had, and how are they being employed right now? So that we could look at how the transition would occur. And we needed that information. Sure. Now, food and so forth looks at, and, and I'll have to say, food is one of the better groups. But um, health and medicine, I, I'll use my wife as an example here. I said, well, we want to create. Um, and forgive me for being off base here, but we want to create um, these community health organizations and so forth. And there wasn't a real tangible or, or, yeah. or visible reason of why stuff. we needed an inventory mm -hmm, for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my caution there would be to, to motivate that inventory early on. Get a good writer in each group. <laughs> a writer who is listening to the information people are bringing in because that's really your inventory. There's people who are coming in with ideas of what exists in an area. Um, one of the members of the water group is one of the more popular uh, 
well developers in the area or water developers in the area. And he had a fairly good idea. But there was nobody in the group willing to write. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so you need writers and you need information gatherers. Exactly. And, and I could see that you've taken the information you got from your energy inventory mm -hmm. and you've gone on and moved on and done work with, done things with that, which we'll get to in a second. But I'm asking whether other groups ha have needed that an inventory in order to then take action in projects. I think so. I know so, okay. personally. Okay. I, uh, the group believes so as an underlying problem. What we've done is kind of an interesting little dance for the last year of the groups that haven't succeeded in doing that. And it's becoming a painful birthing process. Mm -hmm. We have to get there. We have to get back and do our inventory. And everybody's saying that but nobody's quite sure at this point. They're kind of, but there's this project over here, yeah. and, and, and so yeah. forth. Um, and you run well, there's in, a human need for, for wanting to see some results that move you positive in the direction you want to go. Exactly. I mean, we need, and that makes you feel good. And for some, and there are people of different types, you know. There are people mm -hmm. who don't care to study the information and who and want to just get their fingers dirty and, you know, and build things and get that ground going and so on. And so we have to have room for all kinds of types of people. And that's, that's why I recommend, and, and I've done this to other groups too, as I said, get yourself a writer in each group that can listen and that can be taking these notes and can make this happen regardless of the group's momentum. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing you run into is you've got people who are new to the community and people who've been here for a long time. But you're trying to involve the entire community. And if you don't go out and do that inventory, if you don't go out and talk to people and find out things, then you're ignoring what's already happened, what's already been attempted. And as you try to move forward, and you try talking to the city council, talking to the political powers that may be, you say, well, we've had that happen here before, and it didn't succeed. You need to know why it didn't succeed before you even start pushing ahead on the projects. And this is the other facet of why inventories are so important, because they get you out looking at the community, figuring out what resources we have. And that includes other groups that have been in the area and other groups that are currently doing something. And so those are important because you don't want to be duplicating their efforts. That's certainly true. You or they may be sources of your information or can help you work on the project. or Their alliances. Or all those sorts of things, yeah. the alliances. Potential alliances. So one of the fruits then of your in energy inventory came out as as a report. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Tell us about it. Well, it actually came out initially as a large chart. And what we did is we took out each category of fuel that we were able to, to recognize, which is transportation fuels, gasoline, diesel, sometimes kerosene, because kerosene is used in jet engines and, and certain aircraft. Um, you also have firewood, obviously. You have natural gas, and propane for the outlying areas. In our community, natural gas is only in the town mm -hmm. proper. Um, there were some other things that were considered, but they were just so inconsequential they didn't play. So it was very easy to create. And electricity. Which I'm sorry, that's forgive right. me. Electricity, that's a big one. electricity that's a natural big gas. One. I, I always, <laughs> it's like I'm passing over that. The, uh, the goal there was to, uh, well, once we got that information, it was very easy to put it into a table. And I started thinking about it, going, well, if we do this, how about if we show how much carbon dioxide is generated, how many pollutants are generated? And so I'm already working in a spreadsheet, so I could sit there and, and, and say, well, somebody would come with a change of how much firewood or how much gasoline was used. So it's very easy to change this figure, which automatically changed all these, and simply plugging in the CO2 emissions was just another aspect that could come out of that. So this thing continued to grow and take a life on of its own. And then we started talking about, well, what are these fuels that are here locally could we use? And, and could, they be could they be replacements for those that we buy from outside of the areas? So this chart continued to grow, this table, this spreadsheet. And we were saying, well, here's what we currently use. Here's what we visualize being able to use from the local resources to replace this. And by doing that, we're saying, well, how much of this could replace this? And, you know, what's the energy mix? A very important 
note to make, and I'll come back to that, because it, it plays a, a major role in how we visualize the future. So as this thing continued to grow, I said, oh, you know, the note supporting. <laughs> OK, well, um, wood use. Now, what we intend is a certain percentage for fireplace, but also a certain percentage for what's called gasifiers, or biogas, mm -hmm. and so forth. That um, gasifiers are a way of burning uh, wood sort of like a charcoal process, but it burns it in such a way where it gives off a gas that is usable as a fuel to oh, run engines. Okay. Um, and it, it uh, is very low polluting uh, if de designed correctly. I, you know, that's a big uh, mm -hmm. quantification. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, these notes supporting this fuel, this replacement fuel, this local fuel continue to grow. And I said, you know, it's time to just quit playing in this spreadsheet and start moving into a report format. Right. So the first part of the report, obviously, was the current inventory. And another appendix became the expected future mix. Mm -hmm. And of course, more appendices came in as far as each of the types of energy we had identified locally, how they could be used, what machinery would use them, what their efficiencies were, what their costs would be, uh, where um, the companies are located, how to contact Obviously, them. Obviously, that that's a treasure trove. What you, your research on possibilities is a treasure trove for any community to pick mm -hmm. um, information but, from, at and, least. And, and, and I've tried to write this in such a way that it can be used by other communities. If you have wood in your community, obviously you can pull that whole uh, appendix out of there and say, this can go into our report. Here are some resources. You don't necessarily need to duplicate, you can build upon. Right. That was the idea. So the, the inventory ended up being an energy independence report. report. And that energy independence report and the work you did certainly must have been part of the City Council of Willits looking at changing what they're doing with energy in some way. Well, that, How that happened? That report was distributed um, through the city. In fact, we printed probably 60 copies. Uh, we have four common council members, um, so we, we distributed it amongst the major business people in the community, the major politicians in the community, as well as the city administrators and other people that, that played a role. Um, it was very important to get it into as many hands as mm -hmm. possible. Uh, and I have to go back on to one aspect of that or, that we had talked about before this interview, and that is that there are certain things a city can undertake that they can see a, a clear gain for themselves, a benefit for themselves. And there are other things that they wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. It has to be under private or public-private ventures. And these are things that are commercial entities. Uh, the wood gasifier would be something like that. Oh, that would be a private, I believe probably, so. a private yes. enterprise. Because what we're talking about is a fairly large investment, but with a good return. Because you're generating a salable commodity. So it, they be a replacement for propane, is that what, or natural gas? Uh, gasifiers um, could pre produce gas to be used in vehicles, which we ah. try to avoid. Uh, we try to say that. Um, it can be produced for home heating. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there is something called cogeneration, which is a gasifier produces heat in the process. That heat itself, not the energy it produces, but that heat itself can be used in adjacent buildings. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. important aspect mm -hmm. when you start looking at so Where do you locate such a thing? Exactly. Yeah. It's called cogeneration. It's also formally called co-location. Now, co-location is the aspect of I've got a uh, plastics recycler or plastics manufacturer here. Those scraps go into the, the waste stream. But if I locate right downstream of that waste stream a carpet manufacturer, he can be taking the plastic scraps and make a carpeting out of that. I see. The waste products of that, you know, there's always water coming through here, can be used all uh -huh. within this local complex. So this you're looking at, at really using... Within a local look. chain, you know. And Wonderful. So it's not only the energy, but in the case of gasifiers, the heat mm -hmm. or other mm -hmm. byproducts. Mm -hmm. And this is why you start getting the commercial entities, because the city is going to say, well, we have, in the case of Willits, $300,000 a year we're spending on our buildings here. For electricity. That's correct. And so the only thing we can really look at 
is how to offset that. Yes. We yes. can't go out and say, we want to become a community-owned utility right. and do all these things because we're in debt. We need to figure out a way that we can offset our current costs. And I want to interject one thing here. When I first started with Well, one of the first people I met and had a lengthy conversation with was our councilman, Ron Ornstein. And he made a comment that um, we have several large manufacturing spaces that are empty. And I was asking about that. And he made a comment that, well, you know, we don't have really a, a, a good employable workforce here. And I won't go into details there. But the one thing I decided to do is that everything we did in the energy group should be targeted towards increasing revenue streams mm -hmm. in, through the city and increasing employment. Revenue streams is the obvious thing. But if I increase employment here, you remember the gasoline usage of transportation fuels, over 50% of that 30 million? Well, I can reduce that. That's right. right if it's local and they're working local, That's and that also increases your revenue stream here <coughs> for, into the community without Better having to travel out there. Yeah. So I'm gonna move, I want us to move because your mm -hmm. latest, another piece of your inventory or your research You've got a couple of other projects that you're looking at giving advice to the county to. <coughs> one that I think is fascinating having to do with sewage. Well, the, one of the things that came, has come up and looking at, or one of the, um, you, you know, we all kind of look at Common Council and the arguments that go on and the, and the big investments that they want to make or whatever are in the community, the, the infrastructure that needs to be improved or replaced. And a big problem here for the last four or five years has been sewage treatment upgrade. Well, sewage treatment, they want to go to an open wetlands type arrangement. I was looking at how do I create a, a private business that can generate energy to show the city it can be done. And I started thinking, well, we have a lot of farmers out in the valley that we can bring manure in. Um, I can compost this, I can create a methane gas from this mm -hmm. to replace propane and so forth. And then I realized my transportation costs of getting all that manure over here, it's going to be very high. Where do I have a delivery system? And I started thinking, sewage treatment plants, the whole purpose of a sewage treatment plant is to remove the waste, the solids, out of water. Our human manure, huh? It's and, right here. And to cleanse the water so it can be re replaced back into the river. And all that solids that are removed go into the landfill. Yes. So that's, that right there is a cost to the city. Now, I can take that, and this is done in third world countries. India is, is like number one in this, China and so forth, um, with methane biodigesters. So this is proven technology. I mean, we, we're not creating new rocket science. It's proven low-tech technology. And, and let me also quantify when we in the energy group made a decision early on. We would not talk about zero-point energies. We would not talk about anything that's not off the shelf okay. and proven. So things that are here, here that we can use. That we can buy off the shelf, Good. that will work, that have quantifiable efficiencies and costs. Okay. You can't go to a city or a private business yeah. and recommend anything else. Sorry, pie in the sky isn't going to fly here. It's right. not. Yeah. So low technology. Okay. We can take that solid stream create methane out of it, drive it into a, what's, uh, a capstone microturbine to create electricity, to drive, to offset their costs of electricity, to also drive a compressor, to compress the methane gas, to be used as a replacement heating gas. It's a, it's a direct replacement for natural gas. It can be used really? in vehicles really? and so forth. Can it be used in the place of propane as well? Yes. Oh my goodness. Direct. And the, um, and finally, the resultant solids are already partially composted, can be finished composted and sold to local farmers. EPA has a very strong recommendation, which there is a chapter or an appendix in the report, stating the EPA's position on human manure that's been treated in this manner. So there's three products that can come out of this waste stream that's now going to the landfill that the city can profit from if they took this um, step. The figures for doing something like this on a large-scale uh, municipal sewage treatment plant are on the effect of one to two million. That generally, that figure is generally part of their upgrade process. Oh, we need new light bulbs over here, we need new control panels over here. 
on top of they're adding methane biodigester. Methane biodigesters are very inexpensive, generally a quarter million dollars in cost. Really? Yes. Really? And sewage treatment plant in our city is the highest electricity usage. Truly? Yeah. So are there ways to combine, you know, doing some solarization uh, or wind or using other renewables as part of that? The uh, early on, um, about halfway through last year, uh, the council approved the creation of what was called the Ad Hoc Energy Group. So a subset of the Well Energy Group, six people, were pulled aside and met every other week to create this Ad Hoc Group. And we started looking at these issues, um, whether we could create viable energy infrastructure and so forth. That, out of that <clears throat> became the Willett Solarization Plan. We're going to solarize the city. Well, the Sewage treatment plant is about $1.5 million in rebates. So it's about $4 million plus to put solar on that plant. But the rebates are $1.5 million. So we're looking at $2.5 million. I mean, almost in half. Now, how much did I say the methane biodigester would cost? Let me see. Uh, two, uh, goodness. <laughs> now, now, I'm going to touch briefly. I know we've, we're You've running out of time. It's very important when you're looking at ener any energy inventory visualization, what are we going to look at in the future to look at a mix of energy? Because solar is on for, in our area, five hours of insulation per day. That means five hours the sun is, is producing enough radiation to be used to be converted to electricity right. or, or solar. So we need to counter that. If we're looking at 24-7... You need to add to that, because that's only, that's only a so part of what you need. You need to look at wind, you need to look at hydro. Wind is part of the year, hydro in our area is part of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Actually, in our case, we have a, we're very fortunate. We, we could produce some hydro here during uh, most of the year. Uh, biomass comes into play, whether it's ga uh, gasifiers, methane bi mm -hmm. biodigesters, etc., old landfills. They're already flaring off methane. Right. They can immediately have a capstone microturbine dropped onto them and produce electricity. Whoa. Immediately. For about fifty to $100,000, you could be producing electricity with your existing plumbing. These are all things you can look at all around your community. I am. What you're giving us is really exciting news. Mm -hmm. The things are on the ground, already happening, not hugely expensive, pay themselves back, do good things for the environment, keep some energy happening. Mm -hmm. You're doing some pioneering work. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thanks for being our guest on Peak Moment. Community responses to a changing energy future. Join us next episode. Thanks.